Hello, everyone, ladies and gentlemen. I'm very pleased to welcome you here in Severo Institute in Prague at a debate uh, Digital Disinformation Overload organized by the Aspen Institute. Uh, digital is the motto of uh, the new era. We have digital media, factories, uh, nomads, information, and even twins. We want to be digitized as we take it as a positive trend, but on the other hand, we are quite lacking behind when it comes to setting the rules for the digital world and even to understand it. Probably it is because of the, of the amount of information the world is bombing our brain with every day. Uh, as I found uh, the study of the University of California, the amount would overload a laptop within a week. Uh, and the study of the University of California shows our brain receives 23 words every second through the half a day we are awake. So no wonder we are losing track on what's important and even what's true or not. But today we are here to focus on uh, the role of new technologies in this disinformation, propaganda and fake news and about its effect on the core values of our society. Uh, will the AI, the artificial intelligence, uh, help to solve this problem or can it make it even worse? How can a society or even an individual defend him or herself against misinformation? What will help us? Regulation, technologies, we'll ask tonight. So let me welcome you again all here in the name of the Aspen Institute at the debate Digital Disinformation Overload, organized in cooperation with the Severo Institute and the US Embassy in Prague. For the opening, let me welcome Aspen Institute Central Europe President, Mr. Ivan Hodaj. Thank you, uh, thank you very much, Michaela. Uh, can you hear me? Thanks. Um, I don't think I can add too much. You have said it. Uh, you have said basically, basically everything. Uh, but um, I would like to tell you that the um, uh, that the Aspen Institute Central Europe uh, is uh, considering uh, as one of its uh, core part of activities uh, the so, uh, societal impact uh, of digital technology and, uh, in, and um, artificial intelligence. And that's what we are going to uh, basically uh, talk today. Uh, disinformation, uh, manipulation, propaganda, uh, you have mentioned it. Um, this is also a part of a series of conferences that we are organizing with the Aspen Institute Spain and Aspen Institute Germany. Uh, there are seven Aspens in Europe and they all cooperate and, and the three institutes are working on these, uh, on these uh, conferences and concentrating on the aspects that we are going to uh, discuss today. Um, there's nothing much more I can say. I would like to thank, uh, first of all, uh, the whole team of Aspen and the whole team of Severo uh, for everything they have done to prepare this, uh, uh, this evening. Uh, I would like to thank Severo. Uh, for um, giving us this uh, wonderful place uh, and uh, for helping us uh, with this conference. Uh, and the uh, last thing uh, I would like to do is uh, to wish you a, a very interesting evening. I can guarantee you that when I see behind me the names of the people who will be sitting on the panel, uh, I don't think that we can go wrong today and it will be very interesting. And thank you very much, Michal, for moderating the evening. Thank you very much, and we'll come again. It's a pleasure. Thank you for organizing it. Thank you for the opening words. And I would also like to uh, ask for a few words our host, Martina Heranova, the head of Prague Center for Transatlantic Relations at uh, Severo Institute, because she's our host. So the stage is yours for now. Ladies and gentlemen, uh, on behalf of Severo Institute and Prague Center for Transatlantic Relations, I would like also to welcome you in our premises. We are very glad that we can support uh, this public debate on digital disinformation overload uh, organized by the Aspen Institute Central Europe together with other partners. And uh, I think it's, it's very hot and uh, very hot and uh, uh, actual topic. 
uh, which also proves uh, your participation and interest. And I hope that uh, uh, this public debate will bring you interesting inside views as well as incentives for further discussion. Thank you. And I thank you very much. And from now on, this microphone will be ready for all of you to ask questions uh, because we have really very interesting panelists. So now let me welcome here and invite to the stage Mr. David Alandete, ABC Daily correspondent to White House, former chief editor at El País and an author of a book, Fake News, The New Weapon of Mass Destruction. Also, Jamie Fly, Radio Free Europe, Radio Liberty's president and CEO since this August, and former director of the Asia program at the German Marshall Fund from the US. We also have Megan Metzger, research scholar and associate director for research at Stanford University's Global Digital Policy Incubator program. And last but not least, Peter Kreko, social psychologist and political scientist at Political Capital Institute in Hungary. Welcome. <laughs> I'll also take a seat here, not to be standing above you, uh, because for the start uh, into our topic, I think it will be interesting to know your main points uh, so that we know what you want to concentrate on. So David, let me start with you. Your big topic is disinformation about the Catalan referendum. You've also done research in the uh, Italian uh, elections, uh, Brexit referendum, and so on and so on. What kind of disinformation comes into process when it comes to uh, referendums and elections? You have even spoken before the British Parliamentary Committee investigating the fake news in Catalonia. Yes, uh, thank you. Okay, uh, thank you. Yeah, um, I think this is uh, a topic that actually encompasses uh, a broad, a broad uh, uh, array of, of democratic processes. Not only elections, but also referendums and many more aspects of political life. So you talked about the Catalan referendum and my my first contact with this information, and when I talk about this information, I don't just mean propaganda or false information. I mean a government or state-sponsored campaign to make false claims, exaggerations, or propaganda widely circulated in democratic states. So it's very simple. You know we have a Catalan referendum in October 2017. If you've seen it from outside, it seems that there was a democratic push for a vote, that there were thousands of people injured in the streets, that Catalonia just wanted their freedom, and Spain didn't allow it to succeed. That was the disinformation narrative throughout those months. And it was portrayed like that by many outlets, but especially, especially, there was a conscious campaign that was coming from some Russian-funded outlets that were publishing headlines like tanks in the streets of Barcelona. There were no tanks in the streets of Barcelona. NATO may bomb Madrid for 78 hours. Of course, there was no risk of NATO bombing Madrid. Um, a lady tells us the story of how the police broke her five fingers. No one broke fingers. There were charges of the police, of course, but there was an exaggeration that we linked with some analysis of the Spanish intelligence services to specifically two outlets, RT and Sputnik. Both of them are funded by the Russian government, as you may know. There were other outlets, minority, also working in Spanish, English, and some think tanks that were receiving money from uh, Russian government. Cathion was one of them. They were analyzing how George Soros was behind the independence movement, and he was trying to break Spain apart. So we reported on this, but decided to go a little beyond this point to see where these outlets may be working, right? 
We found activity in the Italian relations, of course. We did some research on how the, these Russian outlets in Spanish and Italian, of course, were publishing uh, information that was completely out of what was real regarding crimes <coughs> from migrants, uh, numbers of migrants arriving in Italy. And then we brought this to the last European election, which we uh, researched too, and we saw the same pattern. Now, one year ago I changed jobs, I used to work at the Bayer, which is one of the, the, the leading newspapers in Spain, I want to work for another one, uh, ABC, and I work out with the White House. Uh, and surprisingly, going back to Washington after five years I used to work in Washington, I've seen RT and Sputnik working with correspondents in Spanish in Washington. And I see this pattern being repeated in regards to one of the main topics nowadays in Washington, which is Venezuela and Cuba. How? I'm going to give you an example. Uh, you may know Juan Guaido, uh, opposition leader, uh, was named president acting of Venezuela on uh, January 23rd last year. From that moment on, the United States gave a lot of support to the Venezuelan opposition, to the point that they actually recognized the opposition diplomats as the only legitimate uh, representation of Venezuela in the United States. 53 countries have done the same in the world. So, you know, the United States says, like, okay, the opposition are the legitimate representatives, they have to go into the embassy. There are five Venezuelan properties in Washington, D.C. and New York. The U.S. government with the Secret Service gets to enter four of them. There is a fifth one, the main embassy in Georgetown, big building, very expensive, downtown Georgetown, very nice building. A group named Cold Pink opposes the war, you know, like an activist group, gets inside, who goes inside with them? RT, Sputnik, and two Russian funded outlets. What do they do? They immediately put a banner with the eyes of Hugo Chavez, banner saying John Bolton equals war, uh, Trump uh, wants to bomb Venezuela, all the, the, the things that you can imagine. What do we see there? The RT and Sputnik journalists feeding an anti-imperialist narrative uh, this information narrative of what was going on in Venezuela, war for oil, this is a coup d'etat, etc., etc., but bringing it to Washington, D.C., reporting in Spanish. And you may think this, you know, like Catalonia, the Venezuelan crisis, Cuba, the European elections, may seem small, but consider the size of the Spanish speaking world. And the sphere of influence that working and publishing this information in Spanish may have throughout the world, and the importance of actually portraying an anti-Western, anti-American, anti-European point of view in the Latin American continent and in Spain. So I did this research, I, I still follow them, I, 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 I think they are growing, and I think the problem is far from solved um, because there is a second part, not only identifying these people and knowing what they do and where they are, but also there is the technical side. Yeah. And we'll get to that through the discussion. Perfect. We also have Jamie Fine here. Jamie, uh, as the new president of Radio for Europe, what is the role of media in the international informationally? very complicated world, Alex. Uh, thanks, and thanks to the organizers uh, for having me. So, um, picking up actually where David left off, I mean, I think a lot of this challenge, when we talk about it in the conversation, often focuses on the technical threat uh, that we're, I think, smarter about now than we were, say, three years ago. Uh, at least in the U.S., I think in many parts of Europe, uh, they've been dealing with this challenge. Uh, foreign influence of media, propaganda, and in the U.S. at least, we were somewhat oblivious to it until it hit us in the face in 2016. Um, and I think there's a, all kinds of discussions you can have about that technical aspect of this, the platform problem, the role of companies and regulation, and 
ways that technology and artificial intelligence will actually make the problem worse, or in some cases actually might provide tools that can make it better. So I think that's an important conversation to have. Um, I'm not going to address that right now, though, because uh, although I did some work on that in recent years in uh, previous life, uh, I'm now running uh, a news organization, Radio for Europe, Radio Liberty. And the reason I personally made that shift was in part because I became convinced over time that this went well beyond just a platform problem or a technical problem, and it was a broader assault on truth and the fundamental uh, questions of what is true or untrue. Uh, and that's why I think actually the media, uh, independent media, objective media, uh, and the broader health of media ecosystems uh, in different markets play such an, or will play such an important role. Uh, because I think the only way to address this in the long run is to fight back in that larger battle that's trying to raise doubts uh, and plant questions about whether anything truly is true. Uh, you know, you need multiple alternative sources of information to provide people with fact-based reporting and information. Uh, and so, you know, Radio for Europe, Radio Liberty is obviously a unique institution with unique history. We are funded uh, by the U.S. Congress, uh, and I'm not saying that government-funded media uh, is the answer to this problem whatsoever. I do think it's an important part of it, though, uh, because in many of the countries and the markets that we operate, we operate right now in 26 uh, languages, uh, and have 20 bureaus across all of Eurasia and, and parts of uh, Central and South Asia. Um, sometimes government-funded media are the only media that are actually allowed to operate. Uh, you'll often have a authoritarian government sponsoring state TV, and all other private and local media has been completely shut down and crowded out. Uh, and entities like Voice of America or Radio for Europe, Radio Liberty, and our local services are really the only sources of independent news and information. And we feel in markets like that, we actually play an important role in at least prying open the media space a little bit so that other journalists can at least try to uh, cover certain stories. Um, the other thing that we're doing, and you might wonder why someone who runs an organization called uh, Radio for Europe, Radio, Radio Liberty is talking about the digital space. Um, you know, media organizations uh, need to adapt, and commercial media entities, I think, have obviously done this, uh, following where their audience is. Uh, and government-funded uh, media is doing this as well, at least in our case, you know, despite the fact that we haven't shed our radio heritage, and in many places we still broadcast uh, in radio, we're operating on pretty much every platform available, uh, with TV, significant digital presence. Uh, and making sure that our journalism can actually reach people uh, where they're actually receiving the information. Another thing that we're doing a lot of work on is uh, just basic fact checking, which um, I think a lot of uh, news companies in the US maybe are, are, are moving into as well. We found that especially using digital platforms, uh, using video, you can find innovative ways uh, to highlight things that other outlets have shown that are just fundamentally untrue, the ways that governments try to spread news and information uh, and show it often in a satirical way uh, and highlight that to the audience and it can be uh, quite effective. One final thing that we do is a lot of what we're about is just covering stories that no one else is covering in our market. So for instance, in recent months, uh, with almost weekly protests in Moscow about uh, candidates for the city council elections, um, you know, we did live coverage hours at a time every weekend, bringing news information to a Russian language audience about the fact that these protests were happening, which again, uh, you, you may think in the West, well, what's, what's in it in protest coverage, but is, again, in many of these countries that we operate, uh, protests are never shown on uh, state-sponsored media. It's completely off limits, or even live coverage never happens because of the risk to those governments when they try to go out and cover something live, they don't know what's going to happen. And we captured a lot of the stories that happened on the scene as certain people were arrested, including supporters of uh, President Putin, who were not happy that they got swept up in this broader crackdown. And so these are the ways uh, that we're trying to adjust uh, to that larger uh, environment where truth is under assault. One final thing I'll, I'll say, I do think, and we'll talk more later about the role of the private sector, governments, I do think, have an important role to play here, not just in the debate about regulation of social media, but in just basic 
support for free and independent media. And again, it doesn't have to be a situation where every government funds international efforts like Radio Free Europe, Radio Liberty, or the BBC, or Deutsche Welle. Um, but more governments, more European, transatlantic governments that are willing to speak out when journalists are under assault, when freedom is under attack, when legislation is being uh, proposed in certain countries that would criminalize certain types of speech. What worries me as part of this broader assault on truth that there's also this creeping effort, including in some developing democracies, uh, to actually criminalize speech. And that's part of this broader effort, I think, uh, that will close the media space and make it more difficult for it to happen and to have a free and open debate. Jimmy, thank you. I think you mentioned uh, some topics that we'll hear more about uh, from uh, our other guests. Uh, Megan, uh, for example, you've made many studies as well as uh, recommendations on the social media impact uh, on uh, political protests. So tell us how to keep a balance between combating uh, disinformation and on the other side protecting the human rights. Yeah, first of all, thanks everybody for being here and thank you to the organizers for having me. Um, so I, I think that we're in this really critical moment right now where um, we're sort of at the inflection point where the choices that we make in the next few years are going to determine a lot about the next few decades. Um, and that's because we've seen this enormous technological change and it has enormous positive potentiality. I, I as, um, as Mikhaila mentioned, I did my dissertation on protests in Ukraine and the use of social media, and I've looked at this in other contexts as well. And there are incredible opportunities created for the expression of ideas and the communication of ideas that were very, very difficult um, before for ways to circumvent traditional media channels. On the other hand, exactly what makes that possible during protests also provides opportunities for state to misinform and create disinformation and to expand policies around propaganda and things like that in order to um, in order to reassert state power for states and I should say also for non-state actors I think we're going to mostly talk about this from a state perspective but it's important to keep in mind that it's not only states who can do this one of the things that these new technologies do is make techniques that used to be very costly very time consuming relatively cheap and relatively quick um, and that allows both states that otherwise might not be able to afford such tactics and non-state actors that want to get involved um, to, to, to engage in disinformation online. And so finding what I think is really important when we talk about, we're moving into a space where we're going to talk about regulation, and I'm sure we're going to talk about that more. And right now, I mean, if, if you're here, you know that we're in a real conversation about how we're going to manage um, these new technologies. And I think that one thing that's important to keep in mind as we do this is that we're careful about how we tackle them and that we don't lose track of the importance of the sort of hard-won rights and values that preceded them. And what I mean by this is that um, it's really important that as we try to protect ourselves from the worst uh, sort of negative effects of technology, that we don't do that at the expense of our ability to express ourselves freely and to believe what we want and to access the information that we want to have access to. The internet has the ability to make that more possible. And we should not, as we seek to protect ourselves, we should not out of fear restrict those very rights that were part of what made the internet such a wonderful new technology. And as we start to think about how to regulate, very often we, I, there are conversations around ethics and developing new ethics and new norms. And this is really important, but we should remember that we don't need entirely new norms. Um, many of the problems that we are, are, are dealing with right now are new in form, but not new in kind. Uh, they're problems that we've tackled before. And then there are new components. And so we should work to, to we, and we have already a good foundation of global consensus. We have human rights frameworks that everybody has signed, pretty much, <laughs> and, um, and that have widespread legitimacy. 
And an attempt to develop a totally new set of ethics is unlikely to have that kind of legitimacy. So we shouldn't forget that we have this foundation to build on. And instead, we need to think about how do we articulate what we already have agreed to and believe about human rights and the importance of freedom of expression, the importance of freedom of information. How do we, art how do we articulate that in a way that fits in with new, new digital technologies. And to the extent that, these, that there are, are not easy parallels, how do we create then new norms that are still based on that same foundation? And I'll say briefly that often when I mention human rights in the context of digital technologies, one critique that comes up quite a lot is that uh, lots of countries don't abide by their commitments to human rights in the first place, so what's the point of applying them in the digital context? And I just want to be clear that I'm not naive, and I certainly don't think that all of our problems are instantly solved by just saying the word human rights and then everything gets better. Um, but while these frameworks may not always be perfectly followed and adhered to, they have incredibly widespread legitimacy. In fact, when countries don't follow them, they tend to defend their violation of these in the language of the frameworks themselves because they have widespread legitimacy. And the point of having something to build from is not that everybody's always perfect about it, but that we have some sort of common language and a common set of foundations. So I will just sort of wrap up um, to not go on too long by saying that it's very easy when we are in a moment of sort of panic and fear to respond by being overly restrictive. But I think there are ways to tackle these problems that don't require us to give up on the freedoms and the rights that have been the foundation of sort of global society for, and certainly European society for the last half of a century. Um, and so I hope that we'll keep that in mind as we move forward and we think about how to solve these problems. There aren't any easy answers. Um, I think everybody wishes there was an easy answer. These are complex problems and they do not have simple solutions. Um, and so we need to think carefully about how we tackle those issues um, as, as we move forward. And I'll just add one tiny thing that's like slightly off of that topic, but that I think is important to consider in the conversation. And that is, in addition to keeping in mind sort of a rights-based approach, I also think that we need to remember to test the solutions that we're coming up with. Very often, solutions are recommended that um, have, we haven't tried. So someone will say, why don't you just, with algorithms especially, with, with AI, why don't you just have the AI do it? The answer to that question is very often that the AI can't do it. And, um, but we need to be doing testing and we need to have evidence-based approaches, or else what we do is we create solutions that sometimes have backfire effects and, or don't work, things like that. We have seen that with uh, the example of AI communicating and getting racist quite quickly. Yeah. So, yeah. Uh, yeah. Thank you, Megan. Uh, Peter, you are... Hungary is in a bit different position when I hear about fake news, because if I'm not mistaken, it is said that the government itself works with fake news to its profit. And it even built some kind of company or something that takes care of that. But anyway, now you, as if I'm not mistaken, you want to focus on the role of identity tribalism behind the belief in fake news. So, yeah, um, <clears throat> Thank you very much for, for having me here. And uh, yeah, I'm, I'm a proud alumnus of, of the ESPAN uh, Institute's Young Leadership Program as well. So I'm, I'm always glad uh, when I'm invited by, by ESPAN. I, I have very good memories uh, of, of being in the Slovakian Alps together and so on. Uh, so, but uh, talking about topically as well, uh, a few words about Hungary. Uh, I think Hungary really proves uh, beautifully to certain extent what what Jamie uh, was said that it's there is a broader assault on truth and the problem is that yes we can I, I do think that technology uh, is important and of course sophisticated technological tools can make uh, let's say this kind of post-truth environment even more powerful but at the same time with quite traditional tools you can brainwash people 
uh, in a similar way that I think it was rather typical in the 20th century. And this is for what Hungary is uh, an illustration of. In Hungary, uh, about 80% of the media revenues goes to the pro-governmental media, and uh, there is a huge fake news and conspiracy theories, uh, let's say, empire built up uh, from that. Um, Russia today uh, wanted to open a branch in, in Hungary. There were plans for that. Sergei Lavrov announced it a few years ago. Then there was a budget allocated. There was even a contract uh, signed with one of the journalists. But finally, Moscow abandoned the idea. Why? Because the Hungarian government does it for free. Why to spend any money on, on uh, bringing Russia today to Hungary if you have the same kind of fake news conspiracy theories um, that, that you would spread otherwise, that the West is a horrible place, that uh, liberalism eats it up, that multiculturalism and the migrants are just, uh, let's say, demolish the Western world, and the only strongholds of, of Christianity, uh, of nation state, are, are uh, in the East. So this kind of narrative is quite widespread, and that's why I do think that, that when we talk about disinformation, uh, usually on, let's say, European discussions these days. Previously, what we found is that nobody wanted to talk about Russia, that Russia is one of the source of the disinformation, which was a big problem. Right now, it luckily changed, but I'm afraid that we are going to the uh, other extreme, that we only talk about foreign-funded disinformation from Russia and China, which is, of course, a problem, but I think the most important, let's say, players on the uh, market of post-truth are other domestic political players for whom it brings political profit. Uh, what happened in Hungary is that after a totally post-truth uh, campaign in the 2018 parliamentary elections, when everything was about migrants, was about George Soros and so on, where George Soros spends less money a year in Hungary than pro-governmental campaigns cost a month. Uh, so it makes, uh, so one month of anti-George Soros campaign uh, costed most that uh, George Soros spends uh, a year in, in Hungary. Still, um, and, and with highly traditional sources, it was billboard campaigns, uh, uh, television campaigns, radio, uh, and of course a lot of Facebook advertisements but nothing more, a huge amount of Facebook advertisement, and it resulted in almost 50% of the votes. So you don't necessarily need this highly sophisticated uh, um, media landscape. Uh, if you have a lot of resource as the state, uh, and, and you can concentrate the media, then it can be pretty much enough. Uh, to do that, and it has a huge impact on the public opinion. We can see that, for example, uh, the perception of Russia increased a lot, uh, uh, or uh, yeah, it developed a lot in the last few years, and also the image of the United States deterred rated quite a lot and of, of Western countries. But of course, I mean, there, there are, uh, it's not just totally a Hungarian phenomenon. Uh, I think there is a kind of identity politics in the whole region, which is about painting the East and Eastern Europe as the real stronghold of European values, contrary to the West. And let's, let's find uh, Vladimir Putin as a good ally in that. According to the polls of Glapsak Institute in three out of four uh, Central Eastern European countries, Czech Republic, Slovakia, and Hungary, uh, Vladimir Putin is more popular than both Donald Trump and Chancellor Merkel. And I think it tells uh, uh, quite a lot. And what about the um, tribal drivers of disinformation? I, I think the biggest problem these days is that a lot of politicians come to the conclusion that it's easier to win elections using fake news and, and investing more into the post-truth uh, tools and logic. And it pays off in a lot of cases in the uh, US presidential election, in the Brexit campaign, in the Hungarian campaign, and the list goes and on and on. If you talk with the campaign manager these days, they will tell behind closed doors that everyone uses it. Even the ones, the most democratic politicians have uh, consultants as well who doesn't uh, uh, restrain from using um, fake news conspiracy theories. So this is the zeitgeist. And I think the big problem is that if these tribal drivers of, of, uh, of belief in fake news prevails, which means that you want to believe in that, therefore you will believe in that, because in a highly polarized uh, environment, you need tribal myths 
to win the tribal political war, uh, politicians are fueling these narratives, and on the policy level, it's har hardly difficult to talk, uh, to, to do too much about it. So if the politicians are spreading fake news, then what can you do as a teacher, or what can you do as a think tank, what can you do as a journalist? Of course, you can fact check them, but I think the, the amount of resources is, remains highly asymmetrical. Thank you. Uh, as you've mentioned, the belief that we want to hear only what is our idea. We don't want to support the opposite ones. Or we don't want to wear and we take it for fake news. I think that it was you, you've done an interview with Charlie Beckett, who said the idea of truth is not really about whether it's factually correct. For a lot of readers, fake news is the news you don't agree with. Yeah, that's the concept of emotional truth. It's a very important um, part of current disinformation, which is why I, what, the things that I agree with are true, and the things that I don't agree with are false. And we see a lot of politicians nowadays just deriding everything that they don't agree with or doesn't agree with them, you know, as fake news or false information. And I think. That is a big problem, and I agree with you with the fact that there's a lot of disinformation done in some mm, countries by themselves, by some outlets. But I like to focus on the bigger pattern too, because I, I, I think you said that there's an assault on the truth, and it's true, there is an assault on the truth, but I think there's also, and I'm talking as a journalist, of course, there is an assault on the media. There is a broader assault in all the regimes that are promoting this information against the liberal media elite, the mainstream media, the government media, and outlets that have been doing their job and I think are quintessential for democracy. You know. But anyway, sorry to interrupt you, but isn't it also a fault of the media? Aren't the journalists mm -hmm. in a kind of bubble uh, when uh, they speak about the topics, uh, not only on their news, uh, on their websites, wherever, on Twitter, they are in their bubble, well, that, they that don't get the, out of that. that that's the, the main thing of the problem. So we can agree on the fact that the media has been necessary for the establishment of the democratic system as we know it. You know, The media fiscalizes the government and the media has to go after the government to expose whatever and to actually tell the readers what the government is doing and what the politicians are doing so they can be held accountable every four or five years whenever they go to election. With the digital disruption, and this is what I was pointing towards before, what you have is like the media is getting less and less of the space of the distribution, the platforms are getting all the distribution, and that distribution is mediated. You know, like you can bypass the algorithm and you can fight. But what happens? Outlets, private or public, that have been doing their job for decades with quality and journalistic standards have to compete with things that are, and I say things consciously, that are funded by some governments. Russia or China, you, you pointed, we actually say Russia and China a lot, but it's them who do it. And when you go to Iran, Venezuela, Cuba, they also do it, but they do it with Russian resources most of the time, as you know it. Iran has a Spanish channel, they publish whatever RT publishes in Spanish. The same with Venezuela and Telesur, or Cuba, the same. So my, my point is that there is a worldwide attempt to discredit the media in order to create an alternative reality, an alternative truth, in which, you know, Western capitalist values are just another way of seeing things, you know? And uh, maybe what's happening in Russia is a good alternative to all those problems that you guys have in Europe of like Catalonian independence, Brexit referendum, Trump in the White House, um, you know, like Colombia falling to the guerrillas. So there is a pattern there and there is a worldwide trend of outlets. And just to finish with an example, because I don't want to go beyond my time. But we did an exercise on seeing how the Kremlin reaction to the attempt of bringing humanitarian aid from Colombia to Venezuela in March. You know, they couldn't because they blocked the roads, Maduro blocked the roads, etc., etc. There was a quote from the Kremlin on Daniel this. We found that similar 
story with the same quotes and the same attribution, similar, word by word, in Spanish, in RT, Sputnik, Hispan TV, Telesur, and the Prensa Latina, the Cuban agency. There is a conscious attempt to actually push some views towards some outlets that work in a coordinate way. You said the phenomenon of alternative truth. I always thought there is one truth, but we have now the alternative truth. And that's the domestic players that like to concentrate on broadening the, spread, the, the, the spreading of the alternative truth. And also, I, I turn here because, Megan, you studied that in the Ukrainian uh, Maidan, also at Taksim uh, in, in Turkey. And that's where the role of technology, of the social media, is totally crucial, I think. And so that's a question for you as well. If, if the social media is uh, an advantage, if it makes better position of the reader to get more information, or it made it only worse, and then for you, Jamie, that will be a question as well, because Uh, you spoke about fact-checking, but uh, that's probably what the media don't do that much lately and does more analysis and comments if it is not a counterproductive, but we'll get to that later. Yeah, so, I, I mean, yes. Both. <laughs> <laughs> um, no, I mean, I, I think one of the most interesting things when I was looking in the context of Ukraine was, and I study mostly what, ha what is happening on social media, which is a different, by the way, ecosystem from the total information ecosystem. But we found that the most shared account during the protests uh, was the protest account, the main Euromaidan account, and the second most shared was RT. So on the one hand, I don't know, I mean, a lot of the organization for these protests happened online. Even the stuff we don't observe when I went to Ukraine and interviewed activists, a lot of the communication, even privately, was happening via Facebook. Um, a lot of the, the people I interviewed in Taksim, where we didn't see the same thing around RT, it was a slightly different time at, at that point in Turkey, um, but the, what, a lot of the people that I interviewed there said the way that they stayed safe was through Twitter. So it's certainly being used in these positive ways. And that's not to say these protests might not have happened without uh, Twitter. Other protests have happened without them. But in the case of these protests, a lot of what was happening was being organized on social media. On the other hand, the most shared n news source about those protests in Ukraine was a Russian-funded source. And what I think is the hardest when we talk about RT in comparison to some other types of disinformation or propaganda is that very often, though not always as David pointed out, what RT says is not not true. It's not a lie. It's just a representation from a very, very specific perspective that in aggregate misrepresents the reality on the ground. So it's an overemphasis on uh, nationalists, extremist nationalists at the Ukrainian protests. Were there extremist nationalists at the Ukrainian protests? Yes, there were. Was that a, the dominant force that was leading these protests? No, no it wasn't. Um, it's an emphasis on police being injured versus protesters being injured that doesn't require you to actually lie about numbers. It only requires you to tell the story in a way that, that emphasizes this. And this is what I think is the hardest when we talk about alternative facts or post-truth. It's easier when it's a picture of a campaign rally and there either are or are not 50,000 people there, right? That's much easier. Much harder is to say, As a narrative, you've misrepresented what's going on, even though nothing that you've written is demonstrably factually incorrect. And I think that that's quite hard. And one thing that I'll say is that we, what, what we found in other research on this, looking at RT during the Syrian conflict, is that one of the advantages that they have over, what, particularly in English, so in Arabic it's a little different, but particularly in English, We find that they have a, one of the advantages that they have over Western news sources is that they seem to know how to use social media. They don't. They use hashtags that might actually result in people happening upon their article, whereas 
the BBC, for example, will only use hashtag breaking, which is not going to help anybody. Like, th there's no point in using that hashtag. And it demonstrates sort of a fundamental misunderstanding, or mi there's not really a purpose for that, really, if you're trying to amplify yourself online. So one thing I think is happening is that you have these out, that, that in the case of RT, there's, they're, they're really successful in the online environment. And that is not everything. And it does, doesn't, you know, it doesn't amplify their television ratings that much, but it's something. And I, I think that what we see is that these, I mean, these tools can be used in both directions. And the key is, in some sense, I feel like what we've gone back to is the pre-digital space, which is that uh, oppositions develop new tactics. When the tactics are new and surprising, they tend to work really well. Once the state knows what the tactics are, they can respond well, and the oppositions have to develop new tactics. And we're now in a place where many of the tactics that were new and innovative during Taksim, during your Omaidan, are now the expected response, and so it's become routinized. I just wanted to say very briefly, uh, they will also, journalists affiliated with those channels and Russian, mainly RT, also Sputnik, they will use social network whenever you're a journalist and are covering them and are exposing them, they will use social media to attack you, to create your videos, to expose you, to post photos. This has happened to me in a very limited way, but to many other journalists who also like have been their lives turned upside down because RT journalists or RT employees publish a lot of information, social media, and use social media as a harassment uh, way uh, in order to actually try to cancel negative coverage of them. Thank you. So it seems nobody wants to take the domestic player's <laughs> role as serious. Sorry, Peter. <laughs> no, I, um, we have just uh, done a research with my colleagues at Alta University because I, I, I uh, work there as well. What we found there is that uh, in, we, we tested partisan so-called pipe dream fake news, like that it was for the opposition fake news, like there was an interim election, and the election, I mean the opposition candidate Britain brutally the pro-governmental candidate, which was not true. The, uh, the, on, the, on the governmental side, it was fake news like the uh, Cardinals of Vatican uh, endorsed or praised Viktor Orban for his work on uh, saving Christianity. And what we found is that the most uh, dominant driver for belief in fake news was partisanship. I mean, the more you uh, love the government, the you, you, more you tend to believe in the most stupid uh, fake news pieces you can imagine. It's not a question of, of intelligence. It's not, a, not a really a question of, of uh, let's say, cognitive capacities. If you really love someone, then you tend to believe the most positive things about them. If you really hate someone, on the other hand, and this is what happened with the uh, opposition, with the very strongly committed opposition voters in Hungary, you tend to believe the most stupid uh, things about them as well. And, and in Hungary, for example, let's say 80% of the Fidesz voters believe that uh, George Soros is actively bringing uh, in secret refugees to Europe to uh, attack Hungary and to, uh, uh, to, to demolish the European nation states. Um, and to give another other example, in the United States, 50% of the Republican uh, voters thought before the 2016 presidential election that uh, Hillary Clinton uh, runs a pedophile ring. And I mean, all these, are all these people stupid? I don't think so. It's like that really the, the art of fake news is that they are exploiting our, uh, our emotions and the, the most, the emotions that they can exploit the best are uh, fear, hatred, and, and hope. And these are the ones on the basis of which you can practically spread anything you want. And that's why I think that, that this, is, this is the, uh, I think we live in a new environment where if politicians uh, want to win hearts and minds, they are less and less care about the truth because the voters less and less care about the truth. And that's, that's a sad thing. And that's why I do think that fact-checking is a 
moral, uh, let's say, obligation. It's a, it's a must. To be frank, I'm a, I'm a bit less convinced that how big impact it can, it can make on the, on the broader uh, audiences. I think it's very important for journalists, for experts, for teachers, and so on and so on. For the broader public, unfortunately, it seems that emotionally heated narratives are, are usually um, way more successful. Jamie. Just, to, just to pick up on that, I mean, I, I, I fear I, I share Peter's uh, pessimism uh, about the impact of social media on our, our psyche. Uh, I think that's the really dangerous aspect of this. The way that people now consume news and information, I think, has fundamentally changed. And I think more and more people in many advanced Western societies are open to the notion that there is not one truth. Um, and I think that's partly just because of the way that they engage with the content. Uh, it's partly the way that algorithms have taken over as the editors, essentially, uh, uh, determining a lot of the, uh, what people see. Um, and some of the, the corporate aspects that were built into the platforms, likes and things like that, uh, retweets, um, those have fueled, I think, some of these changes as well. And what worries me is that the traditional media ecosystem, while it's still, elements of it still exist, that's also fundamentally sh shifted. Um, in the United States, local newspapers are, for the most part, gone. Uh, you have a few that are still somehow able to fund themselves. Uh, but some of these sources of news and information that people used to turn to, first and foremost, are probably not coming back at this point, just because of the fundamental commercial realities of the media uh, industry. Um, the other thing I want to pick up on, which I think is an important point about especially what the Russians do, is they're not, uh, they're often not presenting an alternative worldview. Um, they do that sometimes, but more often than not, especially when it's matters that they actually care about, they just want to cloud out the truth and crowd out the truth yeah. and raise doubts about the truth. Uh, and you can see this time and time again. It's what they did for years in coverage of the Syrian civil war and the Syrian opposition. Uh, after the poisoning of Sergei Skripal in the UK, uh, they put out through their various channels, you know, more than 10 different theories. 27. Uh, yeah. <laughs> I didn't realize it was up to 27, but some included U.S. You know, covert biological weapons programs and things Spain like this, too. and yes. accusing a government. whole host of countries of somehow being behind this. They don't care if you believe any one of them. No, they just want to put plant that seed of doubt in people's minds and at least make them question uh, whether there is one real truth. Um, and then finally, I, I do, I do, I am well. I'm pessimistic, I guess. I am hopeful because I see in our work that this technology and social media are incredibly powerful. You see it in the way that protesters in a variety of countries have used it to organize. Um, we see it just in terms of the ease of getting access to authoritarian countries. I mean, back in the uh, Cold War, to get news and information into Prague, we, for a while, uh, our predecessors experimented with balloons. I mean, that was the sort of technology we were trying. Uh, we had to broadcast uh, over short wave and medium wave which is easy to jam. Um, but in most of the places that we operate, uh, we can still reach people on the internet because people widely use uh, VPNs to get access even to banned websites. And even when they ban our website, they can still access our content. And to block us, they literally have to shut down the entire internet, usually in a particular country. Uh, and they do that sometimes, especially in places like Kazakhstan when they're worried about protests. That's what the Russians are threatening to do. Uh, in part with the Russian internet, yes, in different places they can do that, but they realize that that is incredibly dangerous for them to do because their public want to be on the internet, they want to be on social media, and so they are very careful about how much they're willing to restrict internet access that broadly, and so it is possible to, to use the internet to get the truth into some of these closed societies. One final note, what we've also pioneered and some of our services where we're not able to operate, where we're not able to have bureaus, is we rely on people on social media as almost our, our freelance reporters. Um, so our Uzbek service, for instance, uh, gets thousands of tips each year from local social media users that we then do reporting, verify with other people in those areas, highlighting often issues that are uh, of local importance to them that affect their local communities. Uh, and through all kinds of encrypted applications, you can do that safely without putting people at risk, uh, where citizens can essentially become 
a part of that reporting process. Um, and so that's another way that uh, social media, despite its perils and the dangers of it, I think actually may provide some, some hope for the future. I, I think it, that, that is a really good point. And the, 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 the fact that these outlets that publish this information try to just create a fog is also present in how they define themselves. Because when I've talked to them after doing re report uh, reporting on research on, on their activities, they say, oh, we are like the BBC, or we are like Voice of America, or Ra Radio Free Europe, or like Televisión Española, or Deutsche Welle. We're a founded outlet. So I, I, you said that, uh, I, I just wanted to quote very briefly an interview of Margarita Simonian, who is the editor of RT and Sputnik. And she, she the, someone asked her in a, in a magazine why the Russian taxpayer had to found a channel that has 33 languages throughout the world, from Venezuela to Japan. And she said, well, for the same reason as why the country needs a defense ministry. And then she says, we're not fighting anyone, but in 2008 we were fighting, the defense ministry was fighting with Georgia, but we were conducting the information war, and, that, and what's more, against the whole Western world. It's impossible to start making a weapon only when the war already started. That's why the defense ministry is fighting anyone at the moment, but it's ready for defense, so are we. So that is, it's a war not only against governments, politics, it's a war against journalism, against people who are doing their reporting, it's not the same. 27 different versions of the Skripal poisoning, 15 different versions of that plane that crashed flying over Ukraine. Um, Actually, that was the time when it all yeah got very much up. All the fake information started to grow at the time, yeah, 2013. There was an example 14, that I yeah. wanted to, to use to summarize this. Like We had a very early case of disinformation in areas that are not just politics, but are areas that people care about, like soccer in Spain, for instance. We had in, this was 2014, 15, I think, uh, a regional team in Seville, the Betis, I don't know if anyone knows the Betis, but it's like second line uh, in, in, in soccer in Spain. I hope there's no one from Betis hearing me, but they are not in the top tier, let's say it. They hire a Ukrainian player, and this player is a star in Ukraine, and he has been doing the military service, and he's someone that is well respected, and he has photos with other soldiers in Ukraine. Um, he's hired and he arrives in Seville with a t-shirt with the flag of Ukraine, which is the trident, right? And immediately RT and Sputnik publish in Spanish a story saying like neo-Nazi is going to play for a Spanish team. I don't know if you've heard about this. The guy's career was ruined, completely ruined. He was fired. He ended up in another team. He was not able to play. He was just expressing support for his country with a t-shirt with the flag of Ukraine. But the Russian media made him look like a neo-Nazi. And the Spanish media, the newspaper I used to work with included, we did a really poor job and just said, oh, hey, he may be a sympathizer of like Nazi paraphernalia. What's the take of this? Why does Russian disinformation care about like a Ukrainian player? just to create resentment in Spain towards the <laughs> Ukrainian government, the Ukrainian system, the Ukrainian army. I don't know why, but this was something that they started and that went beyond what you may think is like the, the usual line of coverage of politics and diplomacy and international relations. So now I think because at the beginning I said, is the artificial intelligence going to help us to solve this or not? Uh, Tim, you've already mentioned that, that the algorithms are taking over some of our jobs. Uh, also, you worked uh, with the Alliance for Securing Democracy. You made Hamilton 68 uh, like a dashboard to track or the tracks or seeks the Russian propaganda in the United States. Uh, do you see? Uh, positive development uh, ahead of us. Uh, are you more optimistic with the view of artificial intelligence and machine learning helping us? Or the other way around, will it be even worse? Because it's up to us, the users, how we use the 
new technologies. I, I'm, I'm not an expert on artificial intelligence, but what worries me is the lack of transparency about the algorithms that power more and more aspects of our day-to-day -day lives. And uh, I'm not a huge fan of regulation. Um, and uh, I don't think in the US that we're going to probably have sweeping regulation in this area. But the one consistent recommendation that I've always made uh, with my colleagues at the Alliance for Security and Democracy is that the companies need to be more transparent to the users and give them more choice and options to adjust the algorithms, to tell them how the algorithms are actually uh, you know, impacting what they view on a day-to-day -day basis. And that has not happened, mainly because uh, the companies don't want to reveal, I think, to the users what's driving the algorithms because it's tied to, in, the most, in most cases, to their uh, bottom line and the commercial uh, you know, objectives of most of those companies. Um, so for me, that narrow issue is the one with the current, the current uh, kind of cast of social media platforms that needs the most focus. Um, artificial intelligence, though, I do think will uh, provide some interesting tools that news organizations can use in the future um, to maybe help deal with some of the commercial pressures that they're under. Uh, it might make certain types of news, news gathering easier for us. Uh, it would potentially make translation uh, much easier, which with a news organization that's engaging in uh, 26 languages uh, is a huge cost. Um, and so I think there are different areas like that where there are some potential that artificial intelligence uh, could be useful. And it's also, also been shown already by researchers, including things like Hamilton 68, which we did, mm -hmm. you can use artificial intelligence and algorithms to help highlight some of this inauthentic behavior that is happening online. There's been a lot of work done by the academic community, by the think tank community uh, in that space to help push back and to identify the scope of this problem. And so I think with a lot of, like, a lot of the things we've been discussing about, I mean, I started off my career actually uh, in the Defense Department in the U.S. working on uh, weapons of mass destruction. And there we have this term of, uh, it's a dual use weapon. That's how a lot of these technologies, I view Absolutely. them, they are dual use. They can be used for good and they can be used for bad. Uh, and so I think as we discuss about things uh, like artificial intelligence, we just need to have the conversation starting off with that realization that this is a double-edged sword and can be used in uh, either way. Peter? Yeah, the, I, I just want to follow up on that. Yeah, I do think that, I mean, technology does not have its inherent morale. It can be uh, good or can be, can be used for good, can be used for bad. And just as we talk about uh, social media and Facebook, Twitter, and so on and so on, in liberal circles, the dominant narrative is that the populist right and the dictators are the only beneficiaries of Facebook, of Twitter. Uh, while if you read what the pop, I mean, people on the right usually says that the, there is a liberal dictatorship on the Facebook, on, on, on Twitter, and we are silenced. So it, which of course does not prove that, let's say, these platforms are neutral and they are, are just providing good for ev everyone and it's just a false perception. I do think that in the last few years, the enemies of freedom were much more uh, successful in exploiting the advantages of the social media than the uh, friends of freedom, but I, I don't think it, it should be like that anyway. And when it comes to regulation, I think it's, it's really a tricky issue. Uh, in Europe, it becomes, uh, the European Union especially, becomes practically a commonplace that there is a, a need for some kind of, of centralized regulation on the social media. And probably if the European Union comes up with some ideas, it, it uh, can be okay, even if I see the dangers of this identity politics of bashing the United States with the Eurocentric, from a Eurocentric position that all our democratic problems come from the big, U.S. Uh, tech companies, which is, of course, a, a, a simplification, but uh, some uh, non-really democratic governments can be inspired by this idea of regulation, and what uh, Hungarian government officials start to say right now is that there is so strong liberal uh, dictatorship on the social media parentheses, they could exploit the best, the advantages of social media in the elections, but right now they are afraid that they won't um, be able to do it in the future. 
um, parenthesis uh, close. So there is so it it would be so good to regulate the social media if they do not uh, want to provide us enough information. If they uh, the platforms, if they do not want to uh, let's say keep the national laws and and provide users profiles and and so on and so on, then we can just decide to shut them down. And these are uh, statements that leading governmental officials are making. So I think if the governments themselves starts to regulate the social media, it's probably, it won't be the, the, uh, the best. Again. Yeah, I want to, um, I want to return for just a second to AI, um, but then I'm going to connect it to this regulation question. I, I think the thing to remember about all of these things, which is sort of what Peter was saying, is that they're tools. And if you use a tool for what it's designed for, it's really useful and it's really valuable and it does a lot of really good things. So if you have a hammer and you use it to put a nail in the wall, you build a nice house. If you have a hammer and you use it to cook a steak, you're probably going to be disappointed. And if you have a hammer and you use it to hit somebody in the head, they're probably going to be disappointed. <laughs> but the, and the point of that is that when we think about AI, when we think about all of this, but in, I was thinking about it in relation to AI, we have to be really careful about what's the problem and is it a problem that AI is well suited to solve. And very often we think, I, I think we've had a tendency to think, oh, the computer will inherently do it better than the person. Um, and that has in a number of cases with AI that aren't related directly to this discussion turned out to be really not true necessarily. Um, because if you don't have the right data to help train the AI and if you don't have the right information and you're not using it in the right way, then you can wind up with some bad outcomes. So I think the danger when we talk about AI is, is when we think somehow that simply because it's a computer it is better, less biased, more accurate, and, and that is not necessarily the case. That has to be tested, right? So I, I agree. I think there's some, po some really positive potentialities. And there's also some real risks. And I worry a lot, especially when people want to use this for content moderation, where content gets automatic. Some people have argued that you know, co certain types of content should be automatically filtered through AI systems. I don't really like the idea that we're going to be using these algorithms to somehow automatically determine what speech is and is not allowed. There's probably some parameters within which that makes sense. We do this, for example. You already do this. It's not even AI, but you already automatically filter out a lot of child sexual abuse content, for example, online. So there's certain contexts where it's a little bit less um, controversial. But when we think about regulation, like you're talking about, I mean, I think exactly what you, it, there's, it, it's, it's two ways, right? That some of the European regulations place a burden, and not only European regulations, but some of the regulations around content place burdens on the platforms to make the decisions about content being removed in relation to the law. So you have private companies essentially enforcing your laws who are not democratically accountable, who can't be replaced if they make bad decisions. And these laws are often written in ways that incentivize over rather, under, rather than under removal, where there's a penalty if you don't remove, but no penalty if you incorrectly remove. And that's a problem for me, even when it's happening in Germany. But a bigger problem is that it's then being copied in countries where you have an even bigger issue with this, where they say, look, these liberal Western democracies are censoring their internet. I mean, and this is the way that they think about it, so we should be able to censor ours. And then European democracies don't have a good leg to stand on to push back and say, this is not a good regulation, you shouldn't be doing it, because they copied the language from the European regulation. So I think that th this is sort of what I meant in the beginning, that we have to be careful about, I, I'm not sort of saying there should never be any aspect of this that's regulated, but we have to be careful about what the sort of potential and intended consequences are, and we have to think carefully about how those regulations are structured. But the regulation then, who should regulate and to which scope, maybe would be the question. But if I'm not mistaken, last October, Facebook and Twitter deleted the accounts of uh, hundreds of users, including many alternative media outlets maintained by American users as well. Uh, and you've commented, Jamie, on that by, we are just starting to push back. So how should it continue? I think the challenge in uh, Facebook and Twitter and all the platforms are doing this on a regular basis, um, 
previously they weren't really paying any attention to inauthentic behavior. What made them? On their websites. I know the political pressure and uh, the discussion, especially in the U.S. post-2016, about some of the responsibilities um, that they have. It's a thorny issue, though, uh, and I completely share the concerns that this is not something that can be automated. Uh, the companies need, at the end of the day, they can be they can have leads based on tracking of inauthentic behavior, but they then need to try to verify that. Uh, but it's you know it's provoked even the companies then starting to tackle the problem has provoked huge political backlash at least in the U.S. on both the left and the right. Mm -hmm. um, and it is interesting to watch the debate about this because there are conservatives in the U.S. who feel that the companies are biased against them. Uh, the types of individuals that David was describing earlier that engage in commentary about Venezuela and things like that would tell you that the social media companies are trying to block them mm -hmm. and ban them. Uh, and so the actions that have been taken thus far, I think par partly because of that lack of transparency about how they've come to determinations about who to block and who to, to continue to remain active on their platforms, I don't think it's really done a whole lot to address the broader societal unease with the platforms. And that's why I go back to my general recommendation about more transparency from the companies about how they make these decisions, how the algorithms decide which content to highlight. Because even if your account is not shut down, there's still questions about why your particular post may not get the same prominence uh, as a post put forward by someone with a different political viewpoint or a corporate interest or a news organization. And so I think the more transparency, the better in this space from the companies. I did see the latest announcement from Facebook that they are going to be setting up, I guess, some version of the Supreme Court. No oversight. Uh, I'm not sure that that's going to really address <laughs> this concern at the broader societal level at the end of the day. And so I think uh, I'd like to see governments just push the companies more and more towards transparency. And ultimately, users have the ability to push the companies because if they get fed up enough about how the platforms are handling both their data and handling decisions like this, they can remove themselves from the platforms and create problems for their stock price and things like that. So I just think there needs to be more engagement uh, with the companies to try to get them to be transparent about how they make these decisions. Can I very quickly add, just say, and say that's absolutely right, and it's got to be transparency and accessibility of the information. because. One thing that happens a lot is that the companies have actually started to, they're still not anywhere close to where I think they need to be, but they've started to release a lot more information. How many of the people in this room even know that or would know where to get that information or have encountered it incidentally on their Facebook feed or their Twitter feed the way they encounter other information incidentally? They haven't. Is that information available in lots of international languages? <laughs> Certainly not in every language, right? So. My, my point is that it, the transparency is, is really important and they're starting to do that, but part of that has to involve, I think, also a real effort to communicate it rather than just throwing it up on a website somewhere and secretly hoping nobody looks at it. I, and I, like I work on this and live in Silicon Valley and still sometimes I'll be somewhere and be like, it'd be great if you do this and one of the platform people will be like, well, we do do that, it's at this website and I won't have known about it, so. There is something besides the transparency that I think is very important. I mean, I agree, there are a lot of things that have been done in Silicon Valley, a lot of things that we don't even know about. There are things that can be done in Washington and the political circles. And I'm gonna say something that is not very popular and that journalists don't say a lot, but I actually think it's necessary to prevent these outlets and people who say they are journalists from having the access that journalists have. So far, the European Commission, European Union, and other European countries approach is, okay, they say they are journalists, so they have to have the same access to events, data, interviews, etc. They don't... Yeah, well, Macron, when these people dumped information saying that he smoked crack, that, do you remember the Emmanuel Macron leaks before the election? He banned them from going to his events. RT, Sputnik, other min minor outlets. In Washington DC, they are, as you know, forced to register as foreign agents. They have to go to the Justice Department and register as foreign influence agents. Not only them, also Chinese media, also Qatari media, and other state-funded propaganda outlets. This has an effect on them. 
they know they have to behave, they know they have to follow some rules. I mean, when you go to a normal outlet, I'm sure it happens with, with uh, your radio, it happens in newspapers, it happens everywhere. When you make a mistake, you have to have a correction. Things have to be signed, or at least you have to identify an author because he or she is responsible for what, what is being said. You, you have an ombudsman or an ombudswoman, like these things don't exist in this, in this outlet. So I'm gonna give you a little example of something that happened recently that I was telling you before. I work out of the White House, I have the clearance to go and work in federal facilities, and I was invited to cover a, a hospital ship that is going from Norfolk Navy Base to Venezuela, this was in May. So it's a hospital ship with 300 doctors on board. You know there are a lot of refugees fly, like getting out of Venezuela and going north, south, whatever. It's a hospital. Someone in the Navy made a mistake and we had an RT crew inside of the Navy base in Norfolk, which no one realized they were there. I knew who they were, but I didn't say anything. Immediately when we go on board the ship, first question to the captain of the ship, a doctor, it's like, how do we know that you are not going to invade Venezuela? And of course, the captain of the ship is like, have you seen this equipment? I have like x-ray machines, I have 30 doctors. And then, of course, he cuts the interview short, and everybody has to leave the, the ship. This is antagonistic journalism, I mean, or not journalism at all. And actually, putting some limits to these people has an effect. It does have an effect, the fact that they have to abide by the rules that we all follow and that have been established throughout the years, you know. It would be very politically uh, difficult to decide, I would say. But I don't know. But do the... Well, the U.S. has done it. But do the governments really want to do it? Because when we look at the election many times mentioned, uh, 2016, the U.S., Hillary Clinton team uh, hired an expert from Google. Trump's team hired an expert from Facebook. They use the tools that are given for themselves. So do they really want to limit it generally? Probably, Jamie, that would be a question for you because you are insider into it. I think, I mean, we're in an interesting situation because partly because of the way that Russia today is now treated in the US, we're treated the same way in Russia. We have a bureau in Moscow, but uh, we're labeled a foreign agent. And there's a lot of legal issues around that. Um, you know, given, uh, given who funds us, I mean, I think we're not shy about that. We don't hide it in the countries we operate. We're in many countries deemed foreign media and we have different regulatory uh, pressures on us because of that. Our journalists have to get accredited in a way that uh, a local uh, news organization might not uh, have to have its journalists accredited. And sometimes governments use that to make it difficult for us to operate. Um, I tend to think, and there have been these debates in Washington, even with the foreign uh, agent registration, about whether the next step was actually banning certain outlets. I think that's, I do think that's a slippery slope. Um, and I do think that would be used by many other governments to block access, certainly to organizations like our FERL, but uh, a, a whole host of uh, Western media. And so I, I do think we need to be careful about that. Now, some of the issues you're describing, it just comes down to what U.S. government agencies or pretty much anyone who engages in the press, how they decide whether someone is reputable and whether they want to invite someone to cover them or to give interviews. And, you know, I think uh, as someone who worked in the U.S. Senate before, I mean, uh, there are political figures, members of Congress who make those determinations all the time about who they'll talk to and who they won't talk to. Uh, and so you can kind of tackle it that way. The broader problem, though, with especially uh, RT and Sputnik is I think there's a lack of awareness even about who funds them and what ultimately mm -hmm. their agenda is that may get them greater access uh, than they should have. And so that's uh, more of an educational challenge, I think, just to raise awareness about ultimately what their, what their goal is. 
I think Peter wants to react. Yeah, I, I do think that, that for example, Russia, uh, I mean, did a lot of restrictive measures with Western media anyway. So I, I, I'm not entirely sure that, I mean, they will be just inspired by uh, steps against Russia today or Sputnik. You're totally right that they will use it as a rhetoric that, yeah, there are double standards and so on and so on. But I think there are some environments, and I'm not entirely convinced that in the UK or in the US uh, we reach that stage, but for example, in the Baltic countries or in, in uh, some countries uh, or in the post-Soviet space, I mean, when authorities decide to shut down some uh, disinformation outlets that sometimes can spread, I mean, narratives that cost lives literally, uh, I think it, it's something that is a justifiable decision. And, and in some cases, uh, Russia today, Sputnik and others start to spread content that can be deadly dangerous to Western audiences as well. If they uh, buy into the anti-vaccine conspiracy theories, for example, and sometimes they, they are uh, encouraging them as well, uh, it can lead to even more people decide not to vaccinate their children, and they, I mean, it can cost lives. So I think uh, I, I'm not a big fan of uh, banning media outlets, but if it is an, inf the big question is that do we understand it as well as an information war? Because in the war, you don't have to follow totally the same rules and norms than, than uh, in, a, in a peace period. And I think it should be decided on a on a case-by-case -case, uh, uh, basis. And it's, I think in, in some, some um, uh, broadcasters um, in, the, in the United Kingdom decided to take out uh, Russia today from their packages, for example, and they decided themselves, I think, I, I, I'm, or I'm not sure about that, it, they did it about, under political pressure, and I think these kind of decisions uh, could be done as well. I mean, private actors can decide that, okay, there is some kind of state propaganda that we regard as so dangerous that, that we think uh, we do, do not want to share with the public. But I, I, I'm just really concerned that as soon as when we're talking about banning RT on exactly what basis and how will you then evaluate other media in comparison. And the reason I say that is because, so today you ban RT and then tomorrow which outlet is it that is spreading propaganda? The, the, the concern that I have is that, the, so the registration as a foreign agent even that's a little squishy, but there's a clear basis in law with where there's some definition that, that that needs to be met, and it has to be evaluated and established that this definition is met. There's actually quite a lot of debate about whether the recent decision around RT meets that definition. I, I'm not a legal scholar, and I won't have that argument, but there's at least a clear definition in law. I, I think that I worry a lot that if we start, I mean, and so do you say, okay, we're going to ban everything that's, that's a foreign government? Well, then we're banning the BBC and Deutsche Welle, like that rule doesn't work. So what's the rule where you are able to ban this one that you don't like, but you aren't opening yourself up for other things to be banned that are important? And, and this is why, I mean, this is why free expression often errs in a direction that doesn't make us very happy, is because you, otherwise you open yourself up to a situation where you have a different, a change of government or the governments that some of us have now, and the decision is, okay, well, CNN is also propaganda that is, that is damaging to people and is dangerous. I mean, who makes the determination and how is it made and what are the rules? That needs to be very clear and the, the, it needs to be an extremely narrow definition if you're going to do it, and I don't know that I see a clear path to that definition. But I see a very deep difference. I mean, I... For an example, RT is a TV channel that has published a segment about how Hillary Clinton, a member of the Illuminati, ran, ran an underage prostitution ring in a pizza parlor in Washington, D.C., who made that show disappear as if nothing happened and never said anything about it, never like, admitted that they had made a mistake or whatever. We're talking about uh, uh, an outlet with a lot of journalists, a lot of employed people who actually has 
a major network throughout the world in 33 languages saying their editor-in-chief that they are a ministry of defense and that they are designed to make war, I think it's not the same. And when I go to a press conference, and I go to a lot of press conferences in Washington DC, and I see the people of RT next to me, knowing what they say about journalists in social media, knowing how they harass people in social media, and what they stand for, I'm sorry, but it's not the same. I'm not saying you have to ban them, I, I, I would not ever ban them, but they should not be treated as journalists because they are not. Let me just the view from the US, from the Washington, because, the, for example, now we are in a country where the president joked about shooting journalists. Uh, so, well, obviously, journalists are not popular as such, as the kind of people. Well, and let me be clear, I'm not saying they're the same. I'm saying that in order to ban them, you have to write a rule that explicitly explains how and why they're not the same. I'm not, I, look, I'm not here trying to make an argument that RT and CNN are equivalent outlets. In fact, I <laughs> do not believe that. And I think that, um, I, I, I really do not believe that. My point is that, that when you're going to start banning people, you have to be clear about what the definition in order to be banned is. Because if you're not, you eventually wind up with a leader who's corrupt, who takes advantage of this in order to ban a whole bunch of legitimate journalists. Or you wind up with a situation where you can't explain, I mean, if you can't explain to them what makes them different, and I, maybe that rule exists, I don't know, but you would need to be able to clearly define it, and it has to be, I mean, like, so this story about the, 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 the story about Hillary Clinton, I'm not sure the pedophile ring, but for sure on Fox News, they covered the thing about whether she murdered, her team had murdered this Democratic staffer, which is like, I mean, and that was on Fox News. So do you ban Fox News for that? My point is, is not to compare them and not to say that these are the same and not to say that it's the same as other types of journalism. It's that it, once you get into banning people from being able to, to do things, you need to have a clear definition for how and why you did that. That's all. From, yeah, from the regulation, we're... could we maybe get more into uh, also how we personally as the individuals could defend ourselves from the misinformation? Because it seems that definitely, generally, not all governments will be willing to defend us because some of them use it as a tool against or like to get the votes. So uh, what do the individuals, what can do, what we can do? How? If I can just jump back for one sentence to the previous mm -hmm. point, I think, for example, Twitter's decision to limit the advertisements of mm -hmm. Russia, RT and Sputnik, I think it was a good move. And it's if you think about banning, I mean, there is a wide uh, tool of uh, there's a wide toolkit. You don't have to shut down the necessarily totally. the profile, but you can limit the access somehow. And thinking about limiting the access when you have good moral basis for that, I think it's not not uh, necessarily uh, evil. I, but I, I do think that that I mean the cheapest thing that we can hear these days, I think, in the whole Western world, is only blaming the social media. Uh, outlets and companies for spreading fake news because there is a demand side. So we are the consumers of fake news. And unfortunately, I mean, uh, in a lot of cases, if we have deep convictions, then we tend to uh, tend to believe uh, uh, fake news. And, and I do think that if we think about uh, more and more that the technology will develop. And for example, right now we have this kind of fake news. It was spread in Hungary, uh, for example, by, a, by an anti-European fake news side that uh, Chancellor Merkel told in public that the nation states should be dissolved, which would be quite stupid from a leader of a nation state that runs for re-elections. But anyway, it was the fake news piece. And let's imagine that with deep fakes, you have a, a video when she's saying that with her voice in a highly persuasive manner. Uh, so it will go uh, more and more sophisticated uh, in technologically. So I think we should think more and more about how to uh, not only how to teach the people to uh, how to treat the technology, but how to think about that, what uh, statement can be plausible and what not. So I think the most traditional forms of logical thinking are, are something that, that should be resurrected in, in the education, because I, I don't think that, that, I mean, technology will all, always run faster as, the, I mean, the average people can understand it. So I, I think 
I think it will be the huge challenge uh, in, in this post-truth environment. Yeah, and there's actually some decent emerging, but some uh, reasonable evidence from academic research on civic education in this space that suggests that doing, helping to provide education to people on how to recognize fake news, how to evaluate sources, to do critical thinking type things. They've had some decent results from, from that kind of stuff in a range of different settings. So like an intensive setting in Ukraine that IREX did where they, and that they then evaluated a year and a half later and still found effects, which is a big deal because a lot of times what you find is like right away this works, but then it deteriorates. Um, some stuff that has been tested on the platforms and to help educate people about stuff um, and some gamification type approaches that have recently been developed. And we need to do more of this and more research, but I agree that this is a big part of it. I mean, in your daily life, it's like if you look at something and it makes you either really, really angry or it really excites you, you should probably check the source. <laughs> and like, take a second, think about it. Do you really, do you know who it's from? Do you know who wrote it? Do you know what it is? If so, does you sharing it on do anything but make everybody more angry? If not, maybe like, we don't all need to be more angry, but share what you want. But it, I think a lot of times what I find is, sometimes I'm like, yeah, and then I'm like, oh, that's actually not true. It was, <laughs> Quite a lot of times if it seems rule. too good to be true or too bad to be true, it, maybe it is. Anyway, any questions you can also ask? Is, uh, yes, and we have many. Well, okay, so let's start. We have the microphone. So, uh, gentlemen. Uh, can you? I have a question for, for all panel participants. Uh, uh, so, I, I don't know if I should be more happy about what I heard today or more sad. It's kind of mixed in me. But do you have one practical tip for a citizen what we can do tomorrow to help with this? Like, explain to my grandma that the chain email that she got is probably not fine or <laughs> accurate. And what can I do as a business leader or entrepreneur, like paying, uh, I don't know, access to news, to reliable news to my employees? Or do you have some, some kind of practical tips that we can, that you can share? I, I mean, I think what our colleagues just outlined, a, a lot of it's just the critical thinking required, which is difficult maybe to teach someone uh, your, your grandmother's age, because these are things that hopefully were, are, would have been taught at an early age. Um, but I mean, a lot of it's just seek out diverse viewpoints, uh, seek out diverse sources. I was struck, I mean, Russia Today and Sputnik are an incredible challenge, but a lot of the disinformation that gets spread on social media isn't even necessarily through outlets like them. It's fringe websites mm -hmm. that none of us in this room have ever heard of, but somehow when it appears on someone's newsfeed in Facebook, people think it's a legitimate source of information and it's a front website that's been set up by someone sometimes seeking corporate gain in Macedonia, other times with a malign uh, ideological influence. And that's just because people are willing just to click on anything and just take it as fact without uh, thinking about what other sources they sh should check. Um, I do think more awareness of the ideological bubbles in which a lot of the kind of ways we get news information are pushing us is a key to this uh, to solving this problem. Um, because if you have that willingness to step outside that bubble and at least think, I should see what the other side is saying, I think it makes you a, a bit more immune to some of these tactics. Thank you. Uh, more questions over here. So we'll continue to that. Yeah. Well, hello, I'm Mariam. I'm from Georgia. My surname is so big and difficult, I would not say it. I'm from <laughs> Georgia's Reforms Associates. It's a Georgian multi-profile think tank. Thanks, everyone, for your uh, opinions and thoughts. And let me just briefly comment, and then I will also have some questions. You know, we've talked many things about how media is attacked, um, how public is attacked, but I guess we didn't mention that actually we're as a country, as, as a democracy is attacked, our national security is attacked. And therefore, the response to, should be, you know, not only from the journalists, not only from the think tanks and civil societies or teachers or educators, but from the states. And then we definitely need politicians, you know, talking about this issue and recognizing and acknowledging the problem and not shaking heads hands with the bullies like Lavrov and Putin. And you know, David was talking about cartel and referendum. And I remember, if I'm not mistaken, and correct me if I'm wrong, it was Burrell who agreed with Lavrov on establishing 
a working group on cybersecurity. Yeah. And this guy is nominated as a foreign policy chief now uh, on the level of European Union. So it's also about you know, uh, advocating and pushing for our allies in, in the politics. I know that we cannot talk with Zeman definitely about this issue, but I'm sure that in each and every government, in each and every country, we should find allies you know, who will talk about that issue on high level. Uh, without that, I don't believe that only think tank communities, media representatives, and you know, good guys like us gathering in the conferences can do anything about that. Thanks a lot. Yeah, I have a, a comment about that. Um, to be fair, foreign affairs, Spanish Foreign Affairs Minister Josep Borrell signed an agreement with Russia to fight this information, but he didn't follow through and he disowned it immediately. It was more Lavrov caught him in the moment and you know he did like a maneuver, but he actually distanced himself from that. Now, I'm gonna say something that I've said uh, many times and people have been critical of it. Like, Theresa May was a great Prime Minister of the United Kingdom because she actually created a national security team devoted to fighting this information. The only one, the first one. What happened after Brexit referendum? May saw what had happened also in the Scotland referendum. She created a new national security doctrine and a team devoted to fighting that. And what happened when the Skripal case happened in Salisbury, that team gathered and they offered information in real time as it was happening. So the moment you had these, those two people found unconscious in Salisbury, you had a national crisis cabinet telling all the TVs, radios and everybody in the international media, we know these two guys, they came from Russia, this is their passport, there was a third guy. They were leaking the information to Bellingcat and other websites and they were following this through. The only country that has done so. When I researched the Catalonian referendum, I contacted a member of the Spanish intelligence community, a general, and he told me, oh, we know this. I was like, oh, okay, so you know the Russians have been doing this. Why isn't the government doing anything? Oh, it's diplomatically too delicate for the government to act on it. I convinced the government through interviews to actually say something, say something to me. They went to Brussels. Defense Minister Cospedal, she went to Brussels, mentioned that Russia was behind some attacks that they've had. You know what happened to Cospedal? You guys know of Boban and Lexus? It's two comedians in Russia who make prank calls. They call Poroshenko a lot, saying like, hey, you're drunk, huh? And he, he would take the call and think it was some leader. They pretend that they were, I don't know, another, another world leader calling um, any Western president. And they call Cospedal. And they made a prank of Cospedal, they got her cell phone number, and the Spanish Defense Ministry was convinced that these two pranksters in Russia were behind her because she actually went to Brussels and said that Russia was behind the... So they will even, you know, try to catch with this type of disinformation attack the politicians that say this. And to wrap up, I, I, I'm covering Washington DC now, I've covered the Mueller report, we have a report in the Capitol that says that Trump didn't know anything about it. Okay, but there were two campaigns by Russia and the GRU to destabilize the democratic system and to influence in an election, and nothing has happened. No one has acted on it. There's no new cyber command that depends on the national security advisor that will follow this. It's actually people in the Senate and in the House of Representatives who are following this, but you're absolutely right. There's not like a doctrine beyond what the United Kingdom did. I talked to the, to the European Commissioner, former European Commissioner for Digital Agenda, Maria Gabriel, and I asked her like, what are you guys gonna do? It's like, oh, we're not gonna do anything because we don't wanna be a ministry of truth. That's the response. So you're absolutely right. Another question. I'll probably ask you to make a, the, the Shorter. Answers okay, a bit shorter <laughs> so that we manage to answer all. Uh, hello, my name is Adeline Brion. I work for Lie Detector. We are a pan European journalist led news literacy program. So I was very happy that we finally 
got that word in the panel about education, critical thinking, and media literacy. Now, um, uh, to me, I'm convinced that it's a big part of the solution to questions of perspective, of, of post-truth environment, of war on journalism, is about raising awareness and, and increasing resilience among population. And, and maybe the next question for me that I, we don't figure out is how to fund all of this, how to fund media literacy programs that could help the population without getting that question of Ministry of Truth with, by breaking the ties between the funders and the receivers because we noticed on the ground that it's a question that really arises among um, education people. They want to know who you are, where you come from because they're getting critical. So I don't know if maybe the panelists on the left have, a, have an answer for me or I thought about this. I mean, I think funding is always complicated, but I think one way to go about it is to start doing it in schools for everybody and just incorporate it into the curriculum instead of it being something, I mean, I'm not saying there shouldn't be separate education programs because I think that that's great and I think adults need it too, maybe more than even than kids. But um, no, I think that that's one answer. Um, Another answer is to maybe try to do it in small ways on the platforms to encourage the platforms to provide small instances. They've done a little bit of this and they could do more. Um, there's some evidence that the effects may be a little bit better if it's happening on the platform. It's a little new and I'm not 100% sure I'm convinced by it, but it's, an, it's certainly worth looking at. Um, I, I mean, I, so I guess those are my two immediate thoughts of ways to get around the tricky issues you're talking about of funding is put it into something that's already funded or make somebody with lots of money do it. <laughs> Peter? Yeah, I, uh, I do think that, that, uh, that it should be, yeah, it's uh, the most, more central, the better, I think. So it's like, uh, yeah, the best thing is when the governments are financing such programs. In a lot of cases, I think, yeah, I, unfortunately, the political players in most of the cases, I think, have dual uh, motivation. On the one hand, of course, rhetorically, they are really convinced that everyone should be a critically thinking citizen and so on and so on. But when they spread their own fake news, they would really uh, like the people to, to believe in that. So I think, I think if it's a long-term funding and probably something that goes beyond, uh, I mean, uh, governmental cycles, it's, it's uh, uh, probably the best. And I, I think, yeah, the problem is that the m most vulnerable group to disinformation is the most difficult to reach because these are the uh, elder people. So most of the cognitive uh, research shows that elder people uh, can a bit less easily correct the misinformation to say so, which is of course, I mean, correlation of information doesn't mean that all the youngsters are resistant, all the other people are, are uh, non-resistant, but, but, but it's, it's a real, I think this is a real question. And in aging societies uh, where, let's say, half of the electorate in some countries are practically uh, pensioners, then uh, how to fight uh, these threats? So I, I mean, this is, some kind of adult education, but I think we should go beyond the uh, traditional institutions of education to, to find some good responses for that. Thank you. Gentlemen. Good afternoon, I'm Tomasz, I'm from Slovakia, and uh, I made some notes because uh, your debate was uh, very interesting, and since I'm in this uh, field of uh, um, let's say cognitive security, I call it cognitive security for nine years now and I work primarily in context of Slovakia. Uh, I, I have several comments and I would like to start with uh, uh, what I think is the biggest problem here because we, we know what's going on and how to tackle this problem. But for instance in Slovakia and in, other, and in many other countries where I was uh, cooperating, working and trying to build a more functional network so we would be able to um, do something about this problem. We were still facing the same issue if it was in United States, if it was in Britain, if it was in Baltics, if it was in uh, Central Europe. It was always about financial and personal capacities that were not sufficient. And to put it into a, um, 
into numbers. Uh, the latest study from uh, one British um, uh, team uh, showed that the sources of this information can make a profit of 235 million uh, dollars annually. That's like 20,000 outlets uh, and their web pages. We are not talking about the profits they make on social media. On social media, they make few more billions selling ads. It's incredible amount of money and we are not even close to have the same budget in our uh, activities. For instance, the nine years I spent with Cognitive Security, most of the budgets on the projects that I've been working on were close to zero. Zero euros and only the people who were willing to change this because they were aware this is a very big problem that is threatening not only democracy, but it also threatens the health because so many disinform disinformation is about, uh, let's say, these stories that if you drink uh, bleach, you will get healthy and stuff like that. And also, this is also a great financial threat because you were mentioning Brexit for so many times. And if you go to the website Brexit Calculator, you will see that it already costed billions and billions of euros and it's literally destroying the country part. I so, will ask you to make it quite short because we are very yes. short of time. Thank you. So just, just to make a statement and a question is that uh, what are we going to do about it? Because uh, at, at the scale of things I've been seeing in the last years, I don't really think that we are doing enough. And uh, if this was a war or if this was a physical situation, we were literally uh, facing a tsunami and all we have is, is a teaspoon and we are just like, okay, we're going to do, do something about this. And I don't really think this is the case. So. Yeah. To that. First of all, yeah, definitely. But I would say that one thing that is, doesn't fully solve the problem, but that I'd like to see more of, which Peter mentioned earlier, is more demonetization of, of people on social media. Social media doing, I'm, I'm much more comfortable with demonetization than with banning. You have a right to say what you want to say. You do not have a right to make money off of saying something on somebody's pri private platform. And I think that we are, I think we're starting to see more of that and I think we can see more of that. You're right, it doesn't totally solve it because they have independent websites and there's other kinds of things, but it's one part of what's financing this that I actually think is, it's not totally straightforward, but it's more straightforward to tackle and we should be pushing for more of that from the, from the platforms. Yeah, in fact, one of the most successful practices for that comes from Slovakia, the deconspiratory uh, project which aims to demonetize yeah. the, the uh, the fake news sites through push, putting pressure on the companies. Mm -hmm. Thank you. We have two more questions, if I'm not mistaken. Yeah. Good evening. Uh, thank you for your uh, thoughts. Uh, my name is Kateřina Křivánková and I'm leader of project uh, encouraging media literacy among Czech and Slovakia youth. And I would like to ask if it's possible to reach adult somehow and what's the best way because yesterday I received the same question and I didn't know. Uh, in Czech Republic we have a program in television, something like a fun show. Uh, it doesn't really working because it doesn't reach the, uh, the target group. Uh, we wrote a book but the book is read by only but only one who wants to read something about fake news and disinformation. So how to um, convince people that critical thinking and media literacy is sexy or thinking is sexy and it's fine to do it. Thank you. <laughs> Any idea, anyone? <laughs> <laughs> I mean, first of all, you're not going to convince everybody. And I think at some point, I think, I think what's important is to recognize that there may be people at the edges you never convince, but if you can get the middle, then it's good. I don't know, I'm kind of intrigued with this idea of doing it on the platforms, which I, not as the only way, but like, what if in order to use your Facebook, you had to do a little mini training one day, you know? I mean, I don't know, I don't think, I'm not sure platforms would actually do it, but there, but it would be, I think, I don't know if you can convince people it's sexy, but maybe if there are ways to make it so that they're more likely to encounter it. <laughs> I mean, probably, I mean, two things. One is that nobody wants to get deceived. So that's the motivation that you can build on that. I mean, nobody wants to get fooled. And if, if you're calling to the 
attention of people that you can be fooled or you're fooled every day, it, it can be something that, that draws them into the discussion. The other thing what we uh, experience with our projects and articles and so on and so on, that if you say that, yeah, these are the three false stories that you hear every day or these are the three myths that you hear every day and you disclaim them uh, focusing on this let's say, on, on uh, debunking this information, but not saying that this is fact-checking, but saying that uh, these are the funny fake stories. Uh, and then you can pull them into the discussion again. But it has uh, some dangers as well, because if, if it's not a very well-known fake news piece, then probably you can be the one who, who is spreading that. So you, you should raise the question as well that what are the, uh, uh, what is the disinformation that you want to go against without uh, spreading it uh, uh, without deliberation? One, one thing I'd add is I, I think in the U.S. We've, we've struggled in part because uh, public figures have not been willing to weigh in in a clear way always to actually reinforce this warning to the public. Um, some of our law enforcement agencies have tried, uh, the Department of Justice as a result and part of the Mueller investigation has tried to lay out in different settings the threat and how people should be more aware, but for most people to listen to the FBI or listen to the Department of Justice, that doesn't really <laughs> resonate. But there are a lot of popular uh, political figures in, in US politics and the, me the messaging has been incredibly mixed, I think. Uh, and often becomes very partisan, but I really believe that, especially with some of the challenges like elections interference, you need federal, state, and local officials all conveying the same warnings to the public uh, to help make sure that that actual act of elections interference doesn't become uh, even more polarizing and partisan. And for some demographics, especially older uh, generations, there are political leaders that they may look up to and if they, hear, if they hear those individuals warning them to be more careful online and to be more judicious about where they get their news and information, you might have a potential for greater impact. Thank you. And we have a last question. Yes, hello. My name is John Sabo. I'm with the Czech University of Life Sciences. First of all, thank you all today for uh, this very engaging panel. Uh, it's been very insightful and had very interesting uh, aspects to the digital disinformation phenomena. One of the things, however, I felt was lacking and that wasn't picked up until just recently with the gentleman in the front is the economic component to disinformation. And that being, um, you know, we all know that things like clickbait can empower people who create, uh, let's say, fake news content, if we can use that moniker, uh, with significant amounts of uh, financial incentive to continue doing that practice. Um, in fact, one example, I believe in 2016, just before the presidential elections, it was found out that over 100 IPs were traced to a uh, village in a former Yugoslavian state where that entire town had essentially converted from porcelain, um, you know, making things to uh, troll farming. And unsurprisingly, that's, that's quite common nowadays. So one aspect to it of course is attempting to um, go after the economic incentive on that side but why one thing i've not heard of is how can we create fact seeking and i stress the word fact seeking because we seem to be living in an era where fact and truth seem to be decoupled from one another how do we get back to that point and can we can we make fact seeing uh fact seeking a more lucrative enterprise for people to engage in on their own now we want to make fact-seeking more sexy, so <laughs> how? You were speaking about fact-checking, so now we want to... I mean, there are a lot of like debunking uh, sites that have a lot of following and, you know, main outlets like the Washington Post has started like giving Pinocchios and recently gave like Trump an infinite amount of Pinocchios and people seem to engage with this. But I think there's something more basic, which is actually reading the news. You know, like, uh, you may know, the, the last free newspaper in Washington, D.C. ceased operations last Thursday. There are no more, free, you know, those little free newspapers that you gave away, like, doesn't exist anymore. You don't see a newspaper printed, not even like when you go to the White House, journalists don't read the newspaper anymore. No one has a print newspaper. People are canceling their, their cable 
uh, services because people have Netflix and like whatever service you have now, HBO, you don't need CNN, you don't need MSNBC, you don't need Fox News, you don't need anything. So I think it's a more basic step of like actually being conscious that you need to read news, not just rely on your phones. And I think that is, that is an important mindset, listening to the radio, even like through the internet, but you know, be beyond just going to fact checking and making this sexy and like appealing to readers, convince readers that they actually need to make the effort to not pay for news, which is nice, but also like make the effort to go and look for news with trusted sources. I think that's very, very important. From the side of, of I, sort of the platform side, which I, I'm, I'm sort of the platform side person here today for some reason, but um, <laughs> that's not typical. Um, I, I, I think the other thing is that there's been a lot of, they've really had trouble finding a business model for monetizing news on the platforms. I don't think this is something that gets talked about that much, but it's basically advertisers don't really want to advertise against news because you don't want to be a like vacuum cleaners whose ad randomly pops up right after an image of a tornado, right? It's like there's these like these weird things that can happen when you're on news content. And um, and so I, there has, I, I know that there have been issues with traditional news media sites getting sufficiently monetized. And I think that seems like a solvable, like a hard but solvable problem to me from the platform side that is probably even more solvable than the other things that I've said that is one way to do what you're talking about, is make it easier for actual news media, good news media, good journalists, to make some of the money that they're losing on nobody reading paper newspapers anymore back on the social media sites. And I think uh, my understanding is some of the, like Facebook has tried various ways uh, to help news outlets in this direction. The problem, from what I've heard, is that it gets back to the transparency issue I raised earlier, where they will change their news feed to try to help news organizations a little bit, but they may not realize the repercussions of that small change to the algorithm. Right. And then reputable news organizations will have a major collapse of their traffic from that particular platform. Um, yeah. But I think something like that, some better partnership between news outlets and some of the platforms is necessary, partly because I think that old commercial model is, is gone. I mean, yeah. The reality is, sadly, <laughs> I, as, as much I still like to read uh, traditional uh, printed newspapers when I can, um, but I just don't think it's coming back. Yeah. And especially when you get to local news, like I talked about in the US, it's certainly not coming back at this point because no one's willing to fund it. And so I think given where the readers and the audience has gone, we need to find a better way for the platforms to cooperate with reputable news organizations to make sure that there is at least some commercial viability there. Yeah, I agree. So don't rely on the algorithms, be cautious, <laughs> and don't get excited that easily, <laughs> but first check the facts and teach all that your parents and grandparents. And your children. And your children as well. <laughs> so. That's the conclusion, probably, but you all make your own conclusion. Thank you for your question. Thank you for listening. And definitely thank you all for the very interesting debate. I think to Megan Metzger, Peter Krako, Jamie Fly, and Davita Alandete. I think to Aspen Institute for organizing this, several institutes for hosting us. And um, some of you will continue with the discussion more in detail tomorrow. And all of you will definitely continue in the discussion uh, with a glass of wine that I invite you in the name of uh, the organizers just now. So enjoy. Have a nice evening. Thank, thank, you. thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Very much.